Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Jason Maxwell here from J Max Fitness, and I am joined here today with muscle building expert Vince Del Monte. So we're going to talk about you know how Vince got into the game a bit and this thing that that Vince has called gene expression training. So Vince, how about you give a brief bio of who you are and what you do for everyone? Sure. So who I am? I'm a father of uh, two young kids. Beautiful uh, girl who's almost three and uh, a nine month old. And I've been married for about six years. And um, it's crazy. And I've had an online fitness business for 10 years. And uh, I would say it was May 2006, literally like 10 months, 10 years to almost the day here, I launched my first ebook to um, skinny guys. It was called No Nonsense Muscle Building Skinny Guy Secrets to Insane Muscle Gain. And it was basically how I transformed my body. And I was a former long distance runner all through high school and university. I even represented Canada for triathlon. And uh, I was an endurance athlete. I was one of those lean and mean endurance machines. And um, I found my identity in running because I was pretty good at it. And uh, when I went off to uh, university, I ended up living with these guys who were all ripped and muscular. Like I kid you not, these were some of the most buff dudes on campus. And uh, their lifestyle just rubbed off on me. They they seemed to, uh, you know, be the guys guys wanted to be around and the uh, guys that the girls wanted to be with. <laughs> and I always mm -hmm. contributed it to the muscle. These guys were like, I'm like, man, they're all they're so good. They're muscular. They're aesthetic. And you know, we were in our, uh, you know, this is between the ages of 18 to 22. So we were living those days. You know what I mean? And I had this nickname all through university, all through high school, and it was Skinny Vinny kid you not <laughs> skinny Vinny was my nickname and I, and I and it, you know you think ah, it's cute no it wasn't cute it wasn't cute at all uh, that's not what you want to be called when you're you know in your 20s when you're trying to find yourself and you know meet you know hot girls and stuff so I always had this fascination with building muscle I always wondered like I was a good runner right but I always wondered if I mm -hmm. stopped running and I transferred all of this effort that I put into running and you know I was a competitive athlete so it wasn't like a recreation thing we competed at the provincial and national level I'm like what could I do with my body could I get as muscular as these guys could I gain uh, you know round shoulders and bigger arms and a nice chest and ripped abs like I wanted to know what my body was capable of if I put it under the same um, I applied the same effort but with weights I never really did anything with weights you know as a runner, if you're like more than 135 pounds, you're fat. You know, <laughs> you come into the uh, cross country mm -hmm. season 136 pounds, and the coach says, "Hey, Vince, you had a good, you had a good summer, eh?" <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's a bit about me. And um, I've been serving the uh, you know skinny guy muscle building market for the past 10 years, and uh, it's been quite the journey. I mean, I think one of the reasons that I'm still around. I mean, truth be told, uh, Jay, there was a lot of guys who were, you know, selling stuff back in the mid 2000s online who are no longer around and they've just literally vanished. And I feel one of the reasons a lot of guys who are in the, you know, fitness scene selling ebooks and stuff have disappeared. And this is a lesson for maybe any entrepreneurs listening, listening right now is that they never evolved. They didn't evolve. They they kind of stayed stuck in their ways, or they you know just kept it. You know, they never you know really got out of their own comfort zone and continued to increase their knowledge and to work on themselves. And I think that's one of the reasons a lot of people follow me, because I I'm a big believer in um, surrounding yourself with smarter people, and I'm blessed to have a great network of very brilliant people, doctors, and. Um, therapists and coaches and nutritionists and I'm a I'm a sponge man I'm just a sponge I try and learn as much as I can and I think people see me as a bridge to getting access to some really smart people and that's been kind of my business model for the last 10 years I, I basically share what has worked for me and uh, what I've tested out in the real world and uh, you know it all starts by looking at you know what the science says in that and then I'm um, hybrid you know creating a hybrid of that and then, you know, my big, you know, my brand is no nonsense. You know, I take pride in uh, 
do my best to be a no-nonsense guy and just teach guys the most direct and efficient way to do things without the BS and to, uh, you know, have fun along the way too. I mean, I'm not a professional bodybuilder. I've competed many times, but I mean, I'm a family man. You know, I show, you know, one guy I just saw this morning, I kid you not at the gym, he came up to me, watches my Snapchat and he's like, I love your Snapchat, man. I'm like, really? Yeah, thanks, man. Why, why, why do you like, he's like, well, you're not this typical meathead that, you know, just lives and breathes in the, you know, bodybuilding and, you know, lives around your food. I'm like, well, when you get married and have kids, I mean, (laughs) that you can't, (laughs) but I did take pride in that because I really do try and show a balanced approach to, um, you know, you can have a great body in your mid thirties. You can have a great business. You can have great relationships. Uh, you don't have to be, I mean, unless you want to be the world's best, but who's trying to do that? Who's listening to this podcast right now? So, um, mm-hmm. you can achieve some great, great success by, you know, really just knowing what works and sticking to it and being consistent, you know, and avoiding all the BS out there. That's awesome. So, Back to when you did your first muscle building transformation back in university with all those muscly guys. Um, What was the strategy behind that first muscle building transformation that you did yourself? Yeah, it was very different than what you'll read about in the bodybuilding magazines. I was, um, I got um, mentored by a national level bodybuilder. No, national. He was provincial level bodybuilder who was natural. This fellow was in his 40s. He was a local guy from my church of all places. And uh, he basically introduced me to the world of full body workouts. And, you know, all my buddies were doing the split programs. And he's like, no, you got to hit your body parts more frequently with a variety of rep ranges. And, uh, you know, he really um, kept it simple. And uh, I, I really liked the approach because it was a qualitative approach to training. And it made sense with how I was coached with my running. And, you know, if you think about it, if you think like, if you think of it in this terms, um, what's the point of doing 24 junk sets, you know, when you could get the same result, better results from just doing four high quality sets? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So he really focused on getting more from less. He he had a a minimalist approach to, um, working with your body and you know he was really big on you know the whole idea of you are what you can recover from you are what you can recover from so you know knowing that the whole approach was you know variable rep training different rep ranges hit the different muscle fiber types and to hit them frequently you know a couple times per week hit them hard let them rest hit them again. So we weren't in the gym doing 24 sets per body part. And hey, there's a time and place for that. For advanced guys who Mm -hmm, need more volume, there absolutely is a time and place for volume. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But for a beginner starting out, I just needed a few good quality sets. I needed to recover and I needed to hit it again. So that was the premise of the first program. Mm-hmm. I guess we can hear a little bit of uh, yeah. of the family man coming out yeah. in the background, eh? <laughs> yeah, she's, you know, I'm, I'm that's totally play, cool. I'm in her playroom right now. This is the deck, so. Huh. <laughs> Perfect. You know, it's funny that you actually said that because when I first started making the best progress in my life, and I think it was my first muscle building transformation, I was training three to four days per week, full body mm. workouts. Mm. Um, and now you're a WBFF pro and I was just kind of wondering what's the story behind how you began how you began competing yeah it was 2005 Uh, my buddy Sasha is a ripped fitness model Uh, this guy's like shredded all year and I used to watch him compete Uh, back then in the day it was called fame fame was a big organization and uh I just went to the shows and I watched him compete in this fitness model category and these guys weren't like bodybuilders they were like i would say most of these guys were around 170 pounds rip rip to the bone and uh, to be honest it was just an abs show i'm like the, the guys that always won these shows had the best abs i'm like this is cool i wonder how i would do so i just had this curiosity because i came from an athletic background so you know i'm a competitive guy I see the value in having a deadline and working towards something and uh I was just curious. It was more of a matter of curiosity than anything else. And I thought maybe at the time I thought it would help me with my, uh, you know, portfolio, get, maybe get some more clients, but it wasn't much thought. I competed against 36 guys in my first show. I came 17th and, um, I'll be frank. It was demoralizing. I never placed like, to me, it was like, 
I didn't even make the, the first top 10, the first call out. And I talked to this bodybuilder after and he just kind of, he didn't, he said it in a nice way. Cause he knew me. He was like, yeah, you know, you got to really work on your upper body, your arm, <laughs> your calves. He's like, pretty much I'm like, what? I was like, what don't I have to work on? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I quickly realized that if you can't accept criticism, the sport's not for you. So, uh, you know, I kind of just um, got into it. I mean, I don't know if you've competed before, but anyone who's really got into this fitness model world, it is kind of addicting in the sense that you want to just keep bettering yourself and you, you're trying to get this first place prize. Although these shows are, who knows what they're judging. It's always a moving target. But um, what, what was really cool was, you know, you get these great, after pictures you get these awesome pictures and um these pictures can fuel like your business they can fuel your confidence i mean they're really powerful to get like lean and shredded and see what you can do so um you know from 2006 until 2011 you know i, I competed off and on um you know sometimes a couple shows per year it wasn't until 2000 and um 11 that I got really serious and I just wanted to really see what I could do and I decided to hire a coach our mutual friend IFBB pro bodybuilder Ben Pikowski and um, I've been reading a lot about all the different bodybuilders at the time and he was coined the thinking man's bodybuilder and I bought his DVD which was uh, what was it called <laughs> quest to be the best or something and I watched it and a funny thing is uh, me and Ben went to university together like I knew Ben when he was in his early 20s before he started competing. I knew him when he was just, you know, a natural guy and just trained like a beast. I got some funny stories. But uh, anyways, so, uh, you know, we had this, we actually had the same group of friends. This is way back in university. We went to the same school, Western. And um, I reached out to him after I watched his DVD and he was, he was, he sounded like, a, he sounded completely different than all the other bodybuilders. He had a very intelligent approach. He spoke to mechanics and optimization and, uh, you know, you know, really, in, you know, really interesting nutrient timing strategies that I hadn't really been exposed to before. And, uh, you know, really interesting approach to supplementation. And basically I just reached out to him. I said, can you prep me for my next show? And he gave me the price and I said, I'm in. It was very expensive. And, uh, he coached me through text message pretty much and through email. And, uh, four months later I got my pro card. He got me ready for my first pro qualifier. And, uh, I didn't get in my first show and I competed two weeks later and I did get it. And, um, that's how I got the pro card thing. And then, um, which is really not a big deal, but whatever, it, you know, <laughs> um, then I competed at the world championships four months later and then Ben and I linked up and, uh, I had him actually start training me in Toronto. And that's when, um, he really, he got his hands on me and he just started showing me how to move properly in the gym. He basically taught me how to contract my muscle tissue. I'm like, what the hell have I been doing for the last 10 years? And, uh, I'm like, where did you learn all this stuff? <laughs> And he told me about the course he learned this from. It was created by a guy named Tom Purvis. And Tom Fur Purvis is in a completely different league of his own. He's got a YouTube channel. So if you look up Tom Purvis, I think the YouTube channel is called RTS, which stands for Resistance Training Specialist. And um, it's in a, I mean, this guy, he's too smart for his own good. Um, <laughs> but if you start watching his videos, you'll start to hear, you're like, I've heard Ben say that. I've heard Vince say that. And, uh, and a lot of other guys are starting to go to this guy to learn mechanics because we know that when you get execution down, then all this other cool stuff like volume and intensity and frequency, guess what? It actually works. But if you've got shitty mm -hmm. execution, I mean, it goes back to this analogy I always use about a, a car. You know, most guys, their only um, tool when trying to transform their body would be the equivalent of the gas pedal. And, and they don't get the results they want. And, and what do they resort to? Gas pedal, gas pedal. I got to go harder. I got to do more. I got to do more frequency, more volume, more intensity, more, more, more. It's just gas pedal, gas pedal. And they're like missing the most important part of the car, which is the steering wheel. And, you know, Ben pretty much kind of introduced me to the whole concept of steering wheel, like how you're doing things in the gym. And, and this is one of the reasons a lot of guys follow him and follow me and, and you know, really – I like what we put out because we teach you how to do things properly, how to, how to contract the muscle, how to move through a full range of motion, how to challenge different points of the strength curve, how to, you know, manipulate exercise because we understand that exercise is something that happens internally. Your body can't read how much weight is on the bar. Uh, your body understands tension. It understands muscle damage. It understands, um, 
metabolic stress, and these are scientifically proven. This is all done. Uh, this has all been shown in 2010 research that this is what your muscles, uh, it's, it's their language, it's how they communicate. Uh, so if you're not using their primary form of language, they don't know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> so, so that's really where I'm at these days. I'm really trying to teach my people how to do things smarter and not just harder because any monkey can train harder. Anybody can smash the gas pedal. I don't know anybody who can't smash the gas pedal. Uh, but what I do know is a lot of guys, and a lot of guys already have the gas pedal already shoved down to the floor. So it's like, wh how much harder can you push it? <laughs> you know what I mean? How harder it, it's not, you're already pushing it. You're already, you've already used all your gears. So you need to start learning how to optimize movement, execution, recovery, and again, it's just a much more uh, smarter, sustainable way to train. And you know, one of the cool things, um, you know, people have been telling me, uh, you know, they say, Vince, I really like your stuff because not only are you teaching me how to build muscle now, but you're teaching me how to build muscle for a longer period of time. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I'm doing this right now. I'm in my 30s. Well, I'm going to be able to build muscle in my 40s, my 50s, and 60s. And I'm like, damn, that's so freaking awesome. I just met this guy yesterday. He's like two times bigger than me, leaner than me. And um, and I, I just I, I said, are you getting ready for a show? And he's like, yeah, I'm competing this weekend at the Toronto Pro Show. And and I'm like, oh, yeah, cool, man. Good luck. And I was kind of like taken back because he's this big dude. And um, and he, he watches my YouTube videos. <laughs> and I'm like, he's like, yeah, I like your stuff, <laughs> man. I'm like, my stuff? He's like, yeah, your YouTube videos. You put out some really good information. I'm like, well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. He's like, dude, I'm that guy that's like, I've been bang I'm so banged up, man. I'm in my forties and I gotta lift light weights now. And it's the only way I can make gains. And it's because I never, you know, I just you know, it's just gas pedal all the time and I didn't have any other tools. So um I think that's the big message these days, you know, longevity. Nobody's talking about longevity and uh you know, and it works. I mean, when you've got great execution intensity frequency all that other cool program design stuff the physiology stuff works but you got to have execution first and um yeah i think i've said that 10 different ways so there you go <laughs> that's very cool did ben remember you when you reached out to him oh yeah we had we, we used to go to the bar together we had the same group of friends uh yeah so i mean yeah of course yeah he remembered me and uh i mean not like yeah we had the same classes and everything so uh Ben was very intimidating even back then. He was a big guy, you know, like tough, you know, you never know, you know, what he was thinking. He was a super, super cool guy. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, he remembered me and he uh, took me on and, uh, yeah, no, he said I was one of his best clients. Uh, so, I mean, I do what people tell me. So, if you give me our marching orders, I'm going to do them. I'm not going to let a guy That's down like cool. that. <laughs> no, definitely not. With caps that big, how could you? Yeah. Uh, so have you had any other coaches besides Ben that really made a big impact on you? Tons, man. Um, I worked with Dr. John Berardi. Uh, you know, I went through all the precision stuff, nutrition stuff. Dr. John Berardi used to um, lecture at Western University when I was in third year. That's when I met him. So uh, a lot of nutrition stuff from him. Um, you know, I went through all the Charles Paulquin stuff, and I know he's a controversial figure, but uh, he also has a lot of value. There's a lot of things you can learn from him, and um, became great friends with one of his uh, coaches. Uh, coach Ryan Fanley, who's a coach at the NC Division One level. So, I mean, anybody who knows collegiate athletics, I mean, if you're not getting the athlete's results, you're going to get fired, like literally. So uh, I learned a lot of program design stuff from him. Uh, I was mentored from the great Australian strength coach, Ian King, who by far was way ahead of his time and has got some of the best program design books on the market, how to teach, um, how to write, uh, training programs, um, ask Ian, get buffed series. I devoured all that stuff in my early twenties. Um, and that stuff was very influential and still influences the way I write programs today. Um, uh, lately, I mean, now with social media, I mean, it's, it's almost a little too overwhelming, but there are definitely a lot of guys that, um, you know, there's obviously that scientific community that I try and learn from. Um, I, I'm really just, I understand that the most valuable experiments, the most valuable science experiments are the ones that you do on yourself. So while I do value the mm -hmm. science, I'm constantly applying, I'm constantly listening. I understand that, um, you know, I, I have courage to make my own decisions. That was something Ian King taught me. He was like, 
if the science doesn't work for you, screw it. It's like, you know, that's freaking textbook academic stuff. You know, you don't know the studies. You don't know what's going on. You don't know who these people are in the studies, how hard they're working. You don't, there's so many variables you don't know. So you need to make your own decisions based on what's actually happening and let them guide you as a starting point. So early on, I was, you know, kind of given permission, if you will, to make my own decisions and to experiment and realize the most important experiments are the ones that you conduct on yourself. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of people I still learn from and, um, and, and probably the most influential guy right now for me is my MAT therapist. I almost forgot the most important guy. And uh, my MAT therapist, um, is his name's Eric Seifer, and he's from Toronto. He's got a, a, ther a clinic called uh, Core Muscle Activation. If anyone's in the Toronto area and needs to get fixed up, um, I highly recommend going to him. And he's taught me so much about how to properly move in the gym and I mean, every time I go there, I leave with these incredible aha moments, and I've filmed a number. Actually, there's two videos with me and Eric on my YouTube channel, uh, my Day in the Life series. So you can kind of just see. He'll take you. He'll kind of. He'll, he'll look at him and be like, "This guy," um, <laughs> and uh, he's a he's a, a genius, a complete genius. And um, yeah, he's taught me so much about mechanics. So um, yeah, I mean, I've had so I could go on and on. I mean, really. I don't. I, I really learned a lot from Anthony Robbins early on. You know, I listened to a podcast with Anthony Robbins and Lewis Howes the other day, and uh, and um, Lewis asked him, you know, if at the end of your life, all your books were stripped away and you were with your grandchildren and you could only, um, uh, if you could only like tell them one thing, what would it be? And he said one thing about love, and then the other thing that he really took away was like, uh, or he he left with his grandchildren was the whole idea of success leaves clues. And I was like, interesting. It was like, I mean, that's my that's my life summed up. Success leaves clues. I've just really looked at like successful people, and I've never tried to reverse engineer the wheel. Um, you know, I've just kind of tried to look at what's been working and how to adapt it and customize it and make it better for me and for the people to follow me and get people to think about it in a way that they can um, personalize and individualize because that's where the real results happen. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of my uh, whole approach to life in general. Nice. So what about your father? What's the biggest lesson you ever learned from him? <laughs> oh my goodness. We need like 20 hours to do that one. Oh man, my dad's, yeah. I mean, he's by far from, from a life, you know, life standpoint, the most influential man in my life. Um, just heavily involved, heavily engaged in my life and my brother's lives and everyone's life that he's involved in. Um, man, where could I start? One of the big things he, he left with me is, um, you know, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. He, he told me that before I went to university and, uh, you know, I went to Western. It's a pretty crazy party spot. So if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. So, uh, you know, that was a big idea. And, um, you know, he's really helped me with my personal foundation and just really, you know, the important things, my relationship with my wife, with my kids. And, um, you know, he's an encourager. So my dad's like my number one fan. So he's showing me, you know, how to be a fan for others and, you know, how to encourage other people. And, uh, he's, uh, he's just a very, very inspiring and, uh, giving and, um, en encouraging individual. So, you know, one of the big things is like, not what he taught me, but what he showed me, you know, all through university, all through mm -hmm. high school, my dad, I don't think he missed a single event. And, and I know I've, you know, I, I went, it was always kind of getting, it almost got awkward because I have my buddies who compete with me and their parents never came to any events, not all of them, just a few of them. But I'm like, where are your parents? And my pa my dad would come to the small meets. I'm like, dad, don't come to this one. This is like district 10. It's a small event. This is like, it's not even like a regional or, you know, or, you know, not, it's, it's a small race. This is not a big deal. Don't come to this event. It looks bad. And he'd still show up. Sometimes he'd like pull the car around, uh, you know, the, the corner of the track and he'd watch from outside of the fence. And, um, yeah, so anyways, he's, he's heavily, heavily engaged in my life. And I think that's, um, you know, a huge testament to, to show what he values in life and its people. So, uh, you know, in a world where everyone's kind of focused on projects, he's, you know, focused on people. That's pretty awesome. That actually reminds me of, of my dad a bit because when I used to play in a, a rock band and we play like all over Toronto and even in small shows in my small town and he would always try to go to every single one. He'd be the old guy sitting in the back. <laughs> it was good times. That's awesome. Um, those are like, those are so, great memories. Mm -hmm. So back to muscle building, what do you really think is 
the future of muscle building right now? I really think uh, two things. Let's, I'll speak to the mechanics aspect and I'll teach, teach, speak to the physiology aspect. So, you know, there's two things when it comes to muscle building. There's what to do and then there's how to do it. So the what to do, the physiologies, the reps, the sets, the, the tempo, the, the rest periods, the exercise selection. And then there's the how to do it. That's the mechanics. I think the mechanics is going to get more and more popular. I think guys are just going to start looking at these dudes, these genetic freaks on YouTube, doing these incredible things with their body weight and even, you know, with crazy loads and things. And they're just going to say, I can't do that. I can't mm -hmm. do that. And they're going to start trying to find people that have achieved their bodies a smarter way without banging them up and without getting hurt. And uh, so I think learning how to properly lift, um, I think it'll take a lot of time because it's just, it's a hard thing to make sexy. But I think guys who really embrace this um, will have a great, great platform and will have a lot of attention. And then when it comes to the physiology stuff, like I feel like I'm on the cutting edge really with what I'm doing and um, just helping guys personalize their workouts more to what their muscle fiber type is and uh to kind of keep mm -hmm. it simple i mean you probably know guys who do really well with heavy training they, they they you know put on tons of weight and they grow like that it's just like really really simple they just keep adding more and more weight to the bar they get bigger and bigger and bigger but then you got another guy who tries that approach and they're sore for days they're banged up it takes forever for them to recover and they're like adding they can hardly add any weight to the bar to, at, a, at a motivational pace and like this heavy training is just not it's not doing the trick it's not doesn't seem to work as well for me and then vice versa like there's some really really big guys who try and do lightweight training you know higher volume and you know what would be considered lighter weights and they shrivel up and they lose their strength so it's like why is that what's up with that why do some guys get great great gains and other guys get equally as good of gains and they've got very different training methodologies and, and it's quite simple it has to do with your muscle fibers and your muscle fibers uh, can be composed of either slow twitch or fast twitch and uh, we all have like a combination of those muscle fibers within us but there are certainly um, I mean there's different um, spectrums here there's certainly different combinations of them within each person so to start off on the extremes you've got what I would call outliers like sprinters world-class sprinters you see in the, you'll see in the Olympics this summer um, who would be considered 80% fast twitch this has been shown in research mm -hmm. that's called an outlier so not everyone's just you know that Fast, much fast twitch. Then you've got marathon runners, world-class marathon runners on the opposite end of the spectrum who are up to 80% slow twitch throughout their body. And, um, and then you've got the rest of us who kind of sometimes fall somewhere in between, but some of us are outliers and we are far more slow twitch than fast twitch and fast twitch or fast twitch than slow twitch. So uh, you've got also what it's called mixed fiber types. So these are people that might be a blend of both. So there's no such thing as like someone totally one muscle fiber versus it's you're a blend. But the question is, is what percentage of that blend are, are you? And when you figure that out, I mean, it only makes sense to spend more time training for how your body's built. So, you know, I'm not saying if you're primarily slow twitch to never lift heavy again. I'm not saying that because one of the mechanisms of muscle growth is lifting heavy. We know that works from decades of research and just real time, you know, evidence in the gym. Um, however, what I would say to somebody who say more slow twitch is if you looked at your program design, say over a course of, you know, a year, I would say let's spend maybe three quarters of the year focusing on your strengths and then a quarter of the year focusing on um, what's not your strength. So there's a lot of like, you know, philosophical kind of a cool ways to look at this too. I mean, bring your strengths up. Don't bring your weaknesses up because if your body responds better to lighter weights, higher volume training, then live off of that. You know what I mean? And, you know, definitely hit those other fibers and um, spend some time doing it, but not as much. And then the flip would be true for, say, someone who's more primarily fast twitch. I mean, that person should live off of heavy weights. If that's how they're built, live off of them. But, 
you know, still do maybe a quarter of your year, some more slow twitch, you know, hit those slow twitch fibers. So uh, that's kind of the, you know, I think that's going to be really, really interesting for people to start experiencing and, um, and playing with. And um, that's really what I'm starting to move people towards, trying to figure out like what's your primary muscle fiber type and um, genome type, whatever you want to call it, and spend more time there. Live off the muscle fibers that are going to give you the best bang for your buck. That's very cool. So let's say someone comes to you. How do you determine what is their primary muscle fiber? That's a great question. I mean, there's like, let's look at the different methods out there. There are a lot of things out there. Um, I mean, there's muscle biopsy testing, but you don't want to do that. Uh, you'll be like, literally, you won't be able to walk for a year if they did all your body parts. Uh, yeah. gene, there's gene testing, uh, which is pretty expensive. Uh, then there's also looking at your history and to just kind of look at what you're good at. You know, I always start with some simple questions like, you know, how do you jump? Can you can you jump high? Uh, can you get your feet off the ground? Are you, you know, an average jumper? So somebody's ability to jump, their their um, their jump height, their vertical, if you will, is um, is a, a very good indicator because it involves everything in the body. Uh, that's a really good one. Another way is to look at someone's rate of muscle progress. How easily do you gain muscle? Slow, average, fast, and um, Another one that is a great indicator is what they were good at, you know, in high school or good at now. Like, if you look at um, the running world, were you a sprinter? Were you, um, you know, were you really good at 3,000 meters and above, which would be more like long distance running? Or were you better at like middle distance running, like the 800 meters or the 1,500 meters? Or were you really more fast switch and good at everything from like, I'd say 400 meters and down? Um, so, so that's those combination of questions are going to start moving you in the right direction so somebody who could say jump really high who was a sprinter and could build muscle fairly easily that's probably someone who's going to be fast twitch right, so it happens. looks like i i lost vince for for a bit just um wi-fi problems um so what i'm going to do is i'm going to end the interview right here tons of great info um vince actually has a new program out talking about the gene expression training. Uh, it's his no-nonsense muscle building 2.0. And in that, um, he actually teaches you which muscle fiber you are via answering a quiz. And then he has three different sections where, um, three different training programs based on your slow twitch, uh, mixed twitch, or if you're fast twitch. Um, it's very cool. I'll put a link to that in the description of this video. You definitely want to check that out. Um, Vince, thanks so much for coming on. Um, it's been awesome. Lots of great info. I think a lot of guys can learn a lot from you. So thanks so much.